I'm going to take you back uh, to 1906, actually to 1969, when the first movement, that it was called the Women's Liberation Movement in those days, actually came across from America because the original meeting was in Washington at that time, and a group of leftist Marxist women had got together at this very beginning meeting. In, in essence, they wanted a movement of their own, and they turned on their leftist men partners and boyfriends and everything else and said, look, we are going to change the goalposts. We need our own movement. We want our own funding. And there is very little money in left-wing movements. So what we'll do is it will no longer be capitalism that's the problem and that we're going to fight to overcome. We are now going to move it to patriarchy. And I think that's a brilliant strategy. As a, as, a, as a branding issue, how better could you get than half the other part of the human race is going to now pay you for your movement that's going to exclude them and create a multi-million dollar, billion dollar industry over the last 40 years. And year by year, the money gets bigger and bigger. And the numbers of people who fall by the wayside, and certainly the suicide rates for men, the men dragged out of their homes, the laws that are being made to isolate. The original point when I stood up in those great big collectives and pointed out to them that the movement that they created was actually nothing to do with women's needs. They brought to us a Trojan horse. It was called equality, and there needed to be changes made to make women equal in those days. The simple ones were that in my day, you couldn't have contraception from the doctor until you proved that you were getting married. The woman had to actually prove this to the doctor before she was allowed. So you know there was no possibility of abortion. Many, many women died uh, of septicemias and infections. And so, yes, all of us and men welcomed this new movement with open arms. But when I heard what was going on in the collectives, and I heard this, the most chilling phrase to me, and I called it the planned destruction of the family, was that what was said is the new parenting, the new structure would be women and children. That would be the new movement, and men would be disenfranchised because marriage was no longer a safe place, had never been a safe place for women and children. And so gradually the, the ideas began. At that point, I had fought myself to a standstill with this movement. So eventually, long story, but I was thrown out and banned from every single collective. So I went off to do a vision that I'd had from when I was a very small child. Both my parents were violent, both my mother and father. My mother was physically very violent to me. She battered me because I looked like my father. My mother was Canadian. I was in Toronto. I went to school in Toronto. And it was in Toronto that she was at her most violent because we had um, been born in China. We were refugees, and we ended up in, in Toronto because she had a Canadian passport. But she had no nanny, and we had no, nothing to protect us from her rage and anger. And one day she whipped me with an ironing cord and I went to school the next day with scabs and blood. He, he, and I stood there and said to the teacher, look what my mother did to me. And she looked at me and she said, no wonder you're such a terrible child. And she was right. Because my memoir is called Infernal Child. I was extremely dangerous. I was murderous. No one could do anything with me. And it wasn't till later, when I was about nine, and I came across a woman called Miss Williams. And... She was my mentor. She was the woman that I wanted to be. And so that part of me thought, all right, the women's movement isn't where we can heal broken people. The women's movement has no interest in, in domestic violence. It has only main interest is and always has been money. And until you grasp that, then you don't really understand what's going on. So. I went off, opened a tiny community center, 
for mothers and kids who were alone because their husbands were working. They had small children where we could meet and actually work in our communities. Well, it didn't take long before the first woman walked in. She lifted her jersey and she was blue from here down to her waist. And I took her home that night. I couldn't leave her in the house by herself. Very quickly, the next woman to come in, which is no surprise, was her daughter, who was married to a violent man. And then, little by little, women started to trickle in from all over England. I had four rooms, a back kitchen, and an outside lavatory. And very quickly, there were 56 mothers and children in that tiny house, with the women with their backs against the wall and they'd sleep with their heads on the knees, and the kids would sleep on mattresses on the floor. And there was outrage, immediate outrage. The council, that was Hounslow Council, they decided that I was breaking all the health and safety laws and that they would begin trying to jail me, and warrants were taken out. I said, this door will never close, ever, until there is no more need for women and children to come into overcrowded conditions. But I immediately faced something that I only partially understood. I had women coming in, and this is true of men as well, because there's no, there are no differences. People who by accident get involved with a violent person, in my case I'm talking about women, completely by accident, partly sometimes it's because you reach out to the, the child in, that, in your partner because you can see the potential and what you want is to love them to change. And before long you find that you are actually stuck. And I call it the mask of sanity. But it takes a long time sometimes for that mask to slip. And by that time, she finds herself trapped, isolated, her family have been alienated, and she is slowly losing her sense of self. And the same happens to men. It's quite extraordinary the damage that happens to the, the innocent partner because they actually don't even begin to understand what's, come, what's going on because they haven't come from that background. So they've got no warning signals to say, oh yes, well I recognize that. They don't. They really don't. These smart women actually, I realized, they needed refuge, they needed lawyers, they needed uh, support and some counseling, but they were very capable, once they were free of the violent relationship, to move on with their children because they could mother, because they had been mothered. The women that were closest to my heart and are still closest to my heart, like the men, are the ones that have never been parented, mothered, have never been fathered, who, who have come through what has happened to them and to such an extent that I'm not amazed when they're violent and sexually deviant and criminal and all the other things that they are. What else would you expect? There was one man who stands out hugely in my memory. It's called Peter. When he was a boy, his mother was a prostitute and his father sodomized him. The mother abandoned him to the father. And eventually, when he was 13, social services came in and just removed him and put him in a children's home. Subsequently, he strangled a boy of 11 to death in the bushes with his belt. And the chilling thing about Peter is he went back in and finished his lunch. He was obviously put into a, a, a young a youth offenders, and then when he got older, he was moved into prison. And everybody decided that Peter had reformed. Social services patted themselves on the back and, and all the rest of it. When it became obvious that he actually, to me, when the woman came in with his three children and said, this is what's happening, I had to face in that time the social services saying, oh, no, 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 he's reformed. We know he's reformed. And when you look at that and you say to yourself, Nobody can reform from that kind of damage unless somewhere along the way someone has put their arms out to them and said, let's do some work together. And that is what I found and where my heart was, even from the very beginning. It was trying to find out what, how can you heal 
totally broken people. How can you love the unlovable? Because that's what I was seeing with the violent, dysfunctional women that came in. So my figure, which ties up with yours, is of the first 100 women that came into my refuge, 62 were as violent and some more violent than the men they left. And the rest were innocent victims of their partner's violence. So as I could understand it, I had to look at women who were just like my mother, incapable of mothering. She had three children. She never wanted daughters. She got twins. She just wanted a son, but she only wanted her son till he was about seven, and he became a little rumbustuous, noisy boy. And then she just dropped him for the rest of his life. He never really recovered from what she did to him. And to a certain extent, obviously it affected my sister and myself. But as the women were in the refuge, the most interesting thing about all of it is I recognized, because you have to live with somebody's violence to understand fear at such a deep gut level that you actually, the rest of the world becomes an alien place to you. You are just enmeshed in this moment. And I think one of the things that is all of us can say, as children, when we'd wait and we'd hear our father outside the door with a key, the key would go in the lock, and then you'd be very careful to look at his face. Because it, until you saw the look on his face, you didn't know what was going to happen that night. But like most children, because my mother cried and wept and wailed, I saw her as being totally bullied and intimidated by my father. It took me many years, and I was quite a lot older, when I suddenly recognized my mother threw the bomb and my father exploded. Once you realize that, and I realized it was both of them, and the confusing thing for a child is in that situation there is this massive explosion and crying and wailing and weeping. Next morning they're having breakfast together while the three of us have been lying shaking in our beds. So this was what I had to actually work with. And my problem was when I started to look for any literature, there was actually nothing at that point about intimate partner domestic violence. It was never discussed. All the agencies knew about it. It was known right the way through. But the attitude was very simply, this is nothing that anyone is going to discuss. So when the refuge is filling up, the local vicar preached against me and called me a marriage wrecker. Catholic priests came in and went to their Catholic women in there and said, look, you've made your vows, you go back, you've made your bed, you've got to lie on it. So I had to reject him. And uh, in fact, the rabbis as well, they'd send Bene Brith, the women, in to collect the erring wife. And, uh, and I'd have to end up throwing them out as well. So I did a lot of throwing out. But what came out of it all was the desperate need to learn how to love, to learn how to be loved, to develop tools and strategies for knowing how you can actually get through whatever happens to you without this terrible, terrible rage and violence. How we used to have a sticker that said, People are not for hitting. Children are people too. And on the T-shirts of the kids, we would put that sticker. So when the mother lifted her hand, that sticker was there to remind her. The hardest part of it all was, of course, nobody was at all interested in the idea of healing broken people, to say nothing of the, of the totally damaged kids. Their concern was to try and bury this problem they did not want it to come up. I wrote the first book in the world on domestic violence. It was called Scream Quietly or the Neighbors Will Hear. That was Jeannie's husband said when he was beating her. And I remember she was telling me this and I said, well, can I use that? It's a fantastic title. And I wrote the book and I included all the letters. I'd never written a book, so I had all the letters I had and that what was happening at that time. And at the end of it, I put a whole list of all the agencies who knew exactly what was going on, and they all queued up to sue me. 
But, the, but, the, but then the cat was out of the bag, though. They could no longer pretend that this was not an issue because the press got behind it, and so did the public. My problem was they only wanted to hear about innocent victims of partners' violence. What enraged them and made me the, the enemy was I said, no, but it's not like that. It's not a gender issue. It has nothing to do with patriarchy. That's a whole made-up nonsense. It's actually fraud. At that point, before I actually opened the refuge, the women's movement, both across the Western world, became a very fashionable thing to do. And they did get funding, as thousands of women paid to join this movement. In England, it cost you three pounds, ten shillings, which is quite a lot of money, actually, in the 70s. But, but that money was running out, so they needed further funding. And this, I knew, would happen. Even as I actually opened the door and the women poured in, I thought to myself, yeah, this is going to be perfect. It's a perfect issue for a feminist movement who say all men are violent. And it's a perfect funding issue because as long as you make sure that the women are told and everybody is brainwashed into thinking of women as victims, then you have an income and it will become jobs for the girls. And of course, the recruiting areas were in all universities across the Western world. That's where the women professors began the whole women's studies and excluding men, and it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And as women went into the law, they began to change the law, as you know, completely illegal, much of what they've done. Because what they've done is to take a man's right to be innocent before he's proven guilty. That's been taken away. A man, no women, a man has to prove his innocence. And that is the most shocking thing, I think, that has happened in the last 40 years. All now a woman has to do is pick up the phone and he's finished. I know when I was here with Anne, we were, we were touring, and I remember the women explaining to me that the man comes home at night, finds everything's gone. That's called hoovering. She's disappeared with the children. He has no right to know where she is. All he can be told is, she's, she's safe, this is the police, she's safe. Second part of it that made it so difficult is it's, then it's called the silver bullet. If it doesn't get fast enough, then you say that he's molested the children. My attitude to all, towards all this, as other refuges grew, the feminist refuges wouldn't accept alcoholics or women who were drug addicts or women who were violent. So innocent victims of violence who were coming into me, women who just needed refuge but not that much therapy, we moved them on to the refuges. Our people, the people that came in and said and chose, nobody had to do it, but chose to come into this therapeutic program. We also extended that work to take women who were about to lose their children to social services on court orders. They could come into our program. And all men, except in cases where I recognized there was extreme possibility of violence, these are usually men who have been, uh, they've been inside for, for robbery with arms and, and a known violent behavior. All men who, because of what has happened to them in their childhood, have now developed such a psychotic behavior patterns that they are dangerous to the woman and to the children. But even those men, every single man who wanted to see me or anybody in the refuge who was working there, they were welcome to contact us. We hired, actually to begin with, it nuns. They were brilliant and comforting. And they would go and visit any father who suddenly found himself without children. We arranged supervised access if the father had been told he couldn't see the children. And as long as we realized that he wasn't dangerous. And actually, there was no reason, because by the time the man who had suddenly found himself in this position had come to ask for help. And you actually touch him and you say, look, I'm really sorry this is happening to you. The man will then sit down and explain. And one of the most important things is to actually work. We have to take, as far as I'm concerned, we have to take all this out of the hands of courts, out of the hands of lawyers, 
and we have to put it where it belongs. And it belongs in a whole new era where we look at a totally different way of how we take care of each other. One of the major things is as the women came in and lived in the community, many of them expressed the wish that they didn't want to be put out by themselves, where they would be vulnerable and on their own. They too recognized the years of violence they'd suffered from their childhoods, the sexual abuse. Any point in time, a third of the women would be prostitutes. Virtually every single one of them had been sexually abused as a child. So you cannot actually talk about the feminist idea of, of, of uh, prostitution as something that men do to women. In fact, most of my prostitutes worked for themselves. They didn't have pimps. And for them, it was going to be something they had to make a choice about. My attitude was if you want to stop and you want to work, then fine, I'll help you. But if this is what you think you need to do, that's your business, as long as you make sure that the children that you've brought in, you don't take them. It wasn't about moralizing with people or imposing things on them. It was about saying, I know you want to love and I know you want to be loved. These are the tools that will help. And you were talking about language. Most people from very violent homes don't have emotional language. That they are actually bereft of being able to explain feelings. And the most important part was to be able to help a woman to go from this hurts to instant rage, to say there are other ways of handling this, because I used to call it orgasmic rage, because once she'd exploded and done the damage that she did to her partner or to her children, then came the calm. And we used to have to work on that to where actually after a period of time you could see as she began to become much more voluble, as she began to, we did a lot of poetry, women and, and men too, writing poems because those were the words that are easy to start with. And then we used to sit for hours, everybody talking about feelings. So 10 o'clock in the morning, the kids went off with the play staff who were usually virtually all men with some women working with them. That's the first time the children knew good, kind, gentle men. And they're forbidden in refuges. The shelter movement will not allow men to work directly with children or even sometimes to come into the shelters. And I have been in here, when I was here last with Anne, we were talking about the fact that the shelter movement is actually bunkers that could brainwash women into this whole concept that they have to remain victims. And actually, they learn very quickly, if they dare to try and take responsibility for their behavior, they will be in big trouble with the sisterhood. So I had, I had to make a decision. Was I going to join in with this massive battle against the feminists from the very beginning, or was I going to do what mattered to me and to my heart? And I chose, because I knew I wasn't going to win this battle, they were so highly organized that what I needed to do was to actually work with directly with men and, and, and women and children. And it was only actually, I left uh, home yesterday and the day before I was talking to a man, he's in his 40s, and he had that night, he had emailed me and other people. He's quite isolated and he said, I'm going to kill myself. And then I got... I was asleep, obviously, at the time, and when I woke up, I, I contacted him, and he did actually go, and he tried to carbon monoxide himself in his garage. And I ended up saying to him, no one can stop you killing yourself, no one. But I want you to understand that many of us, including some of us here, including me, had to come to terms with the fact that we were not loved. It isn't that my mother didn't want to love us. She wasn't mothered. She was very abused by her stepmother. So you see the generations coming down like this. And I think it's the responsibility of everyone to take, to, to, you have to look at where you've come from, what you've learned from it, why the patterns are there and why you do what you do. And also, you know, the biggest lesson I received was when I was, Yet again, 
hand, putting my hand out trying to rescue and feeling that I could see all this potential. And friends said to me, Erin, has it ever crossed your mind that the child that you're trying to reach inside that person is dead? I'd never, never considered that. And he said, and what you're doing is, if you take that on, you are going to be carrying the corpse for the rest of your life. And he was right. And I think a lot of you know what I'm saying. All of us are responsible for the choices we make. I used to say to the mothers, first choice can be an accident. The second can be careless. But time, you do it third time, you've really got to look at what you're doing and why you're doing it. And you see, this work went over 12 years. So by the time the women were pouring through the door, a millionaire bought me a very big house that was filled to the ceiling almost immediately. So because we had no other alternative, as a group, and we worked with men who were plumbers, they, they all piled in to help me. We had this huge squatting domain Squatting, if you know, is you can take a house that isn't being used. And in those days, it was a civil offense. So my idea was you put, as you've got very big houses, you put, say, 15 mothers and, and perhaps 30 kids in the house, and then the borough's not going to touch you because they'd have to rehouse them all. And the biggest squat I had was Palm Court Hotel in Richmond. It had 47 private suites, and we took that one night. So we got bigger and bigger and bigger. And we worked, and this huge family evolved. And the boys, which worked so well, they are all married up and matched with men who'd helped them to learn to build, to plumber, to electricity, to actually skim walls. They were the men in those boys' lives that were their mentors. And it worked. And the, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the beautiful part of it all was I created a boy's house. And these are boys, well, boys are 18, 19, but they're three-year-old babies. And you just, I had this big room where we had all the toys, Tonka toys, fortresses, all the childhood toys that we don't get as battered children. Nobody bothers about toys for that because the, the, family, the parents are too busy warring with each other or one intimidating the other. And you see these huge lads with... with with records of violence, with records of all sorts of things, lying on the floor, playing with the toys, with each other. And you could just see them grow. Many of the mothers would go down to the playgroup with the staff and play and sing. They never, no one ever taught them to sing to their children. This is a possible program. This is the way we should be going. We shouldn't be sitting here having to go on yet again about what this evil empire is doing. It's doing it to men, women, and children. I want one day to make many of these women accountable. I want to actually charge them with fraud. I want... To, yeah, I do. <laughs> Hillary, Hillary Clinton would be the first on my list. She is behind a huge amount of what's going on, and she wants to bring the Violence Against Women's Act global. Can you imagine the amount of money they can make? Sorry, what was her name again? Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and then we have a woman called Harriet Harman. She produced a policy document. She's the Minister for Women and she's in the Labour Party. And in the document it states that men aren't necessarily harmonious to marriage. And that became the policy document that is now in force. Talking about the laws, we've got a new law now coming in England. I don't know if you have it here. It's called the Cinderella Law. You see, what they do, the feminists behind all this, the radical feminists, they spread the definition of domestic violence so wide. This new one's called neglect. Who's going to decide what neglect is? Social workers are going to decide. And this time, they're saying that children can give evidence. Now, when did we last see that? It's coming. If we can't stop it, you'll get it. It'll go to America. And then children will give evidence against not their mothers, their fathers. Yeah. 
Sorry? No, I'm actually talking about the communist regime, which is where children did give. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. Yes. But actually, at the end of the day, this is, this is a group. Any time you get a group like this, who by definition have decided that another group are actually evil, and this is the scapegoating that goes on. These men are the scapegoats, and you can drive the men out into the desert. And for a long time, and it's only just recently, and thank God for a voice for men, men have been at, found a platform where they can get together. And that, I think, is the beginning of the massive change. Men who stood up and said, we've had enough. We're men going our own way, MGTOW. Men who have said, we're not going to risk any longer being harassed and, and polarized and demonized. And now, women are going to have to sit back and think, okay, where are we now? All I can say from my experience, there was a time when any time I spoke, I would have been screamed at and harassed and there would have been pickets outside. I spoke at a big women's festival in London and the room was packed with young women. And I ended saying, if men and women don't get together to work to stop this, then there is no future for us or our children. And you know, they all agreed. And that's my great hope. I believe that the wind of change is now coming. And what we have to look now very, very coldly is this has nothing to do, the radical feminist movement has nothing to do with the pain and suffering of people or children. They're not interested. It is an empire, and it is an evil empire. And I'm late at night. I'm sorry I'm tired because I didn't get to sleep till about 2 o'clock this morning. So I'm so pleased to be able to talk to you. I'm so pleased to see Anne, and I'm so pleased to see some of you I've seen before. And thank you very much. And Attila, thank you. <laughs> That's all right, darling.